Ukrainian parliament approved a law about electronic declaration for officials, which was proposed by the president Petro Poroshenko. Corrections to this law are coordinated with the European Union under the Visa Free Dialogue. 278 deputies voted for this law. Let me remind that another requirement for free visa regime between Ukraine and EU is start of work of the anti-corruption national agency. I collected all documents for filling declaration in new way by electronic system of declaring. Nothing difficult, nothing scared. It took half a day. These declarations require officials the same as in other civilized world. Open their assets honestly. Let's make this decision and start from yourself. The law on electronic declaration was signed by the president. Poroshenko visited a document at a meeting with representatives of the committee that elects members for the National Agency for Prevention of Corruption. The new body is another condition for Europe to allow with a free regime. However, the agency cannot start working without the appointment of the head of commission. Moreover, President of Ukraine Petro Poroshenko went to Brussels for a three-lateral meeting with President of European Commission Jean-Claude Juncker and President of the Council of Europe Donald Tusk about free visa regime. As a result, the European Commission in April is ready to announce the submission of a legislative proposal on visa liberalization for Ukraine. The Ukraine in the last days and hours has undertaken huge uh, reforms uh, mainly as far as the adoption of the e-declarations law is concerned or as far as the appointment of the members of the anti-corruption agency is uh, concerned. These steps, and I know that the President took um, personal interest in this and was very much engaged in that uh, direction, these steps taken by Ukraine will allow us as a Commission to make a proposal for visa liberalization in April. We achieved the criteria for visa liberalization with EU and that's why me as a Ukrainian president, Ukrainian government, Ukrainian parliament and Ukrainian people are very happy to hear from the Commission, from Jean-Claude, from Donald that you are presenting the legislative proposal for the visa-free regime. And to discuss the current political issues in Ukraine, we invited Alexander Hara, diplomat expert of the Foundation Maidan of Foreign Affairs. Nice to meet you. Okay. Um, could you please tell, in your opinion, does this visa liberal liberalization process uh, will end successfully for Ukraine as it promised in 2016? Well, who knows, and possibly the president knows uh, when it, it will be over and when the uh, Ukrainian people uh, will get this, uh, at last, this uh, visa liberalization uh, format. Um, I would say that uh, Europeans, uh, the, it's, it, it's not the first time that Europeans were trying to save the face of Ukrainian authorities, uh, saying what should be done just to get this uh, visa liberalization regime. We remember uh, the issues with uh, the Prosecutor General with uh, some amendments uh, with regard to the um, civil rights uh, of uh, certain groups and so on and so on. So the homework of Ukrainian side has been done not uh, at the highest level and that's why uh, this uh, process has been uh, postponed for, for, for such a period of time. But in case that Ukraine will fulfill all the necessary conditions, uh, could you see any uh, other probably threats will, that will bother uh, such process? For example? No, I don't think no. any any troubles, any problems uh, if uh, Ukraine uh, duly fulfill all the requirements. And actually, I would say that the visa liberalization process important in itself. We, even without getting visas, it's so important to uh, make uh, reforms, real reforms in the in, in law enforcement, enforcement agencies, uh, in the prosecutor's general's office, in, in other spheres that uh, strengthen the Ukrainian ab ability of Ukrainian po powers, uh, Ukrainian authorities to, to uh, keep uh, law in order. So it's important uh, per se, not just uh, for getting um, you know, permission to, to travel uh, freely in Europe. I see. And let's return to other results achieved during this week's parliamentary plenary session. 
Verkhovna Rada has made two attempts to pass laws for the return to budget the money corrupted by previous government during their pre-trial investigation, and both times did not get enough support for the adoption of corresponding laws. Deputies who do not support these laws said that it is human rights violation. Those who favor argued that these laws allow Ukraine to return 50 billion hryvnias stolen by Yanukovych and his team. Bill 4057 was failed five times. Dear friends, I want to note that 7 billion grivnas from these funds was already allocated on modernization and purchasing weapons. From these funds, 2 billion laid on the development of the space industry. From these funds, laid improving social standards, pensions and other benefits. And recently, Verkhovna Rada managed to pass the bill on confiscation of arrested funds. Deputies decided to correct all mistakes till second reading of the law. But the main question on the Ukrainian political agenda still remains the issue of government's resignation. There are talks around going around the possible candidates for the prime minister position, and yet there is no consensus reached. The situation worsens by the split of parliamentary coalition that leaves uncertainty for the future of stability of Ukrainian state. The details are now following story. Three-week break before the parliament sitting does not bring any progress in trying to find peace to renew the current government and to suggest new candidate for position of new prime minister of Ukraine. Government crisis becomes deeper and obviously split and parliament coalition will not be resolved. This week, members of Ukrainian parliament brought boxes with signatures of Ukrainian citizens who support the resignation of current government to the session hall in order to demonstrate the absence of trust to Arseniy Yatsenyuk and his team. All the country demands resignation of Arseniy Yatsenyuk and current government. Put this bill finally on voting. And those who will not vote for this bill have to take the responsibility for everything that will happen in country further. But voting for resignation of government cannot be legal, because one month ago Ukrainian parliament had already voted for the appropriate bill. Then there were not enough votes and as a result current government had got the immunity till the autumn. The only one way to change the current prime minister is if he hands the resignation of his own accord. But pro-prime minister faction assures that Arseniy Yatsenyuk has no reasons to hand the resignation voluntarily. Despite of this fact, on the eve, President of Ukraine Petro Poroshenko gathered the conciliation board in order to overcome government and coalition crises. As soon as Prime Minister hands in resignation, we will suggest new candidate on this position. We are waiting for this for a long time. We have program candidate and votes. Later, it has become known that representative of Samopomoch political force, Mayor Lviv, Andriy Sadovy was suggested on position of Prime Minister of Ukraine, but he and his political party refused from this variant. Prime Minister must have majority in Parliament, but for now Samopomich faction has 26 MPs, so you should be responsible accepting such offer. Moreover, Samopomich faction does not want to come back to coalition until their demands are not executed. There are resignation of Prosecutor General, renewing of Central Election Commission Board, which works from Yanukovych time, and new electoral law. What do all these movements around the prime minister's position mean? Officials are going to spin up the time till the autumn because their positions bring them concrete money and bribes. Then they are going to buy votes at the new parliament elections. As politicians so expert assured that current situation around government provoked unconvertible process inside coalition, which will lead to new parliament elections already this autumn. I would like to ask you whether such um, concerning such history of these um, talks and issues of government's resignation and uh, the confrontation in the parliament, how does it influence the image of Ukraine on the world stage? 
I would begin with the positive uh, points. Uh, first of all, it's a political process. Uh, secondly, in spite uh, that uh, we have uh, not a high quality parliament at the moment, but it's much better than it was before. And I hope uh, the next parliament will be more democratic uh, and more efficient in terms of uh, working together. Uh, what is important that the uh, coalition talks are being held. Uh, our Western partners are relying on the, uh, let's say, common sense of our uh, political elite, not to dissolve the parliament, not to uh, break into the new elections, which will certainly affect uh, Ukrainian ability to withstand the Russian aggression. Uh, certainly it will affect our um, uh, ability to fulfill uh, those promises to the international financial institutions uh, that provided uh, Ukraine with, with a huge amount of uh, financial assistance. So it's a positive thing. And certainly the negative thing that uh, people are struggling for power, uh, people are struggling for names, not the ideas uh, that uh, usually could be found uh, in, in such a way, um, in, in such uh, cases in other parliaments of the well, um, how to say, well-established democracies. Thank you. So uh, let us continue with other important events around the globe. On March 14, Russian President Putin announced the start of withdrawing Russian military forces from Syria, which provoked the world community to the hot discussion on the motives and consequences of such decision. The details watch in our next story. Russian bombers, cargo and passenger aircrafts from Syrian base of Khmeimim were preparing to take off at dawn. At night, officers were checking mechanisms, fueling tanks to the brim and loading equipment. Russian planes got off the ground when the day was breaking. The words of President Vladimir Putin that Russia removes its troops from Syria were quite unexpectedly, according to the world press. He announced his decision at a meeting with the ministers of defense and foreign affairs. Russia in a short time has created in Syria a small in number but very effective military alignment, notably of mixed forces and means. In fact, the effective works of our military has created conditions for the beginning of the peace process. As a result of strikes, it became possible to stop heavily and in some places to completely end the resource support of terrorists. Nevertheless, Russia takes not all the military from Syria. The marine base in Tartus and aviation in Khmeimim will be working. Anti-aircraft missile system S-400 are also left. The decision of Moscow to withdraw the army was supported by the Western and Middle East politicians. Well, at this point, uh, we uh, welcome the decision. Uh, we hope that it means that the ceasefire will hold and that it's a reflection of Russia's view that the ceasefire will hold. The fact that the, a semi-ceasefire has been holding in Syria is welcome news. It's something that we've been asking for for uh, at least two and a half, three years. Now we have to wait and see. Uh, of course, the message that the international community has been sending to Daesh and should be sending to Daesh and other extremist organizations is that our fight against them is relentless. We will not stop, and I believe the entire international community is united in that. Military mission in Syria, the Kremlin launched in September last year on the invitation of President Bashar al-Assad. The Russian army backed government troops and attacked the positions of the terrorists as well as opposition. The civil war in Syria started five years ago. Since then, 250,000 people died and millions became refugees. And yet Russia does not withdraw main forces from Syria. It was reported by Press Secretary of Pentagon Peter Cook. He underlined that Russian aircrafts really left the country, but there is no massive withdrawing of troops. Russians are continuing bombarding of some Syrian regions, Pentagon officials report. At the same time, it has become known that next week State Secretary John Kerry will visit Moscow. Situation in Syria and Ukraine are on the agenda. And uh, I would like to um, ask you to share the opinion on the uh, interrelation between the removal, Russian, Russian troops removal from Syria and uh, some probably consequences on the um, conflict in the east of Ukraine. Do you see this? Well, there is no direct linkage, but uh, in, in reality, uh, I would say that in terms of cost benefits, uh, Putin gained a small victory in, in Syria. Uh, first of all, uh, he broke. Uh, he just he was uh, successful in breaking the isolation. Uh, secondly, uh, the on the west on the western part, they see him as a partner, uh, equal partner around the table, how to negotiate the Syrian uh, Syrian resolution. 
uh, thirdly, uh, he fulfilled his uh, objectives with regard to Syria itself. So Assad is on place and he will be part of the so-called political uh, process. Uh, secondly, he uh, gained the control over some uh, strategically important cities in, in Syria. He installed military base and the, uh, I mean, air, air base and the naval port. Uh, and we will, uh, he will uh, control, control it, uh, uh, so it will give him an opportunity to return uh, in, uh, let's say, a couple of days' uh, time. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, he is trying to impose on, this, on, this, on Syria uh, the federalization uh, solution, as has been proposed uh, for Ukraine. So uh, Kurds, uh, controlled and sponsored by, by, by Russia, are saying that they are not going to succeed uh, Syria. They would love to stay with Syria, but uh, in a sort of federation or confederation. Uh, certainly, it's, uh, it will give an uh, hand, uh, upper hand uh, for Putin uh, over the Syrian situation in the future. At the same time, uh, Putin uh, shaken the, the ability uh, of the United States to project its power in the region, and certainly it will be, you know, uh, it will bring much, uh, uh, how to say, their consequences for the United States in the, in the region because they, they just failed uh, to impose their agenda. With regard to Ukraine, uh, certainly Putin will try to trade uh, Syrian, uh, I would say, uh, in, breakfast, in brackets, uh, positive approach, uh, uh, with aim to replace Ukrainian agenda, um, I mean, the stance of the Western countries uh, with regard to Ukraine. So he would love to change uh, Syrian uh, uh, compromise for Ukrainian compromise, but I, I see no uh, real perspective in this, and the, there was a uh, clear statement uh, a couple of days ago from the European part uh, that uh, uh, the only condition that sanctions could be lifted from Russia is the fulfillment of Minsk agreement. Uh, Crimean sanctions will remain until after uh, Russia returns uh, Crimea back to Ukraine. And, uh, and other issues uh, will, be, uh, will remain the same. But do you think that uh, there will be an intensification of military action in Donbass, actually? Oh, with no that? doubt. There will be intensification and possibly a major scale offensive of uh, the uh, irregular regular forces created and controlled by Russia, we, which is the right way to, co to call all these guys. Uh, unfortunately, we call them terrorists. They are not. Uh, it's one thing. Uh, second uh, thing, uh, Ukrainian side uh, and during the uh, trilateral meetings uh, of contact, contact group in Minsk are not, uh, how to say, stepping back and not uh, fulfilling uh, promises, as Putin said, uh, uh, to hold the elections on not controlled territories. Uh, so uh, Putin tries to uh, return these uh, occupied territories on his terms uh, with the aim to control the whole territory of Ukraine or to ignite the real civil war, which is not taking place at the moment. So uh, certainly he will need to push our, our government uh, to do something with it, uh, to make some concessions. It's one thing. Second thing, uh, we just um, will see some, uh, um, some, some troubles uh, between the um, June, uh, within June when uh, the European Union is uh, going to revise the sanctions or uh, uh, seize them. Till September, when the parliamentary elections will be held in Moscow, so he will need some good, uh, good signs uh, for propaganda uh, to boost the popularity of not that popular uh, pro uh, Putin pro, pro Kremlin parties. So uh, in in summer we will see some uh, some hot events, uh, hot spots in Donbass. I see. Thank you. And let us um, continue further to the news direct, directly from the front line. It is one of the most close to Donetsk strong position of Ukrainian army. It constantly undergoes attacks. The safest way to get to it is by armored carrier. This is a funnel from 122 mm shell. It bursts into the ground to a depth of 2 meters and kills everything around. They beat us by flame shells. They fired 10 shells. The field caught fire. It was burning ahead and behind of us. 
Trenches and shelters protect from the debris, so the soldiers in between the shell fire equip the fortification. They fire upon us with high-caliber mortars and also with howitzers. There are craters everywhere. Such a situation is in all the strongholds of the unit. Another key point is Avdiivka. Are shootings often here? Here's the answer to your question. Ukrainian military outset their terrorists from here and took control of strategic crossroad by which terrorists in Gorlyka received ammunition and reinforcement. Therefore, they do not leave attempts to recapture the town. They fear that we will monitor the way to Donetsk, by which they get the ammunition. This intercharge is strategically important. They are trying to take Donetsk filtration plant, which, according to Minsk agreements, shouldn't not be occupied by anyone. Neither separatists, nor us. Besides the shelling of residential areas, the separatists are trying to control the water supply to surrounding towns. The situation with water supply is unstable. There is no water in Avdiivka. It's very difficult. I live on the fifth floor. Bullets broke my window. They shoot from Yasinovata. Local residents who have no place to go suffer from attacks. I was in the garden, I heard shots, it was a sniper, the bullets were going closer. I hid behind the house, very scary. While Angela Merkel and François Hollande expressed concern about the intensification of military action in Donbass, they reaffirmed that sanctions against Russia will not be cancelled until it does not fulfill Minsk agreements. This applies in particular the release of hostages, a ceasefire, and the withdrawal of Russian military equipment that was stated during the meeting with the president of Ukraine in Brussels on 17th of March. And this week, European Union countries unanimously approved five principles on which the future relations of Union with Russia will be built. This was stated by the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Federica Mogherini. The first principle applies to the full implementation of Minsk agreements by Russia. Federica Mogherini also mentioned the illegal annexation of Crimea two years ago and stressed that the EU members retain the position of its non-recognition. Five uh, guiding principles of the European Union policy towards Russia. Uh, first uh, of this guiding principle is uh, uh, the full implementation of the Minsk agreements as a key element for any substantial change in our relations. Uh, by the way, this is an important week. Uh, it's uh, uh, the week uh, where two years ago uh, the illegal annexation of Crimea took place. Uh, and we restated our common strong position of non-recognition of uh, the annexation of Crimea. Recalling two years ago began the Russian occupation of Crimea. Soldiers and armored vehicles without insignia seized key objects and blocked Ukrainian military bases. The new government in Kyiv did not venture on violent confrontation. The Russian forces took advantage and quickly appointed a referendum on joining the peninsula to Russia. Let's recall how it was. Under the supervision of Russian troops on March 16, 214, in de facto occupied Crimea, the polling stations opened. <laughs> European monitors didn't send observers, but many journalists tried to record the violations. On the video, journalists expelled by force from polling station during the vote count. <laughs> A large number of residents of Crimea, the descendants of those who settled in the peninsula instead of deported by Stalin Crimean Tatars. For them, Russia, the incarnation of nostalgia for Soviet times.
We are Russian people. We want to Russia. We want a powerful state. We had enough of democracy. We want a big country. Crimean Tatars who suffered from persecution during Soviet times made a stand against illegitimate referendum. I don't want war. I want peace. But these voices were not heard, so as the claims of other countries to stop Russian aggression. And soon after the referendum, the war in the east of Ukraine started. Those who two years ago warmly welcomed Russian troops now face it, said reality. Russia laid down their own rules for the local business. Meanwhile, fewer and fewer tourists visit the occupied Crimea. So still after the two years of annexation of Crimea, we can see the assurance of support by the all civilized world of Ukraine and the non-recognition of the annexation. So can we expect that um, action of our Western partners will be more decisive and the international community will actually uh, um, support uh, us to return the peninsula? First of all, I'd like to say that the Russians have approved uh, their occupation technique. In 1940, they occupied Estonia in, 40, in 50 days. And there was in the same pattern, uh, the, uh, the entrance of the military forces, then seizure of the parliament, then the referendum, uh, not referendum, but it, there was an uh, election campaign in one week, and then uh, proclamation of the uh, succession to, to, the, to the Soviet Union. So uh, it took uh, almost uh, 50 years to get rid of Russians from, uh, from the Baltic states. I think that it will get less time uh, to get uh, Russians from the uh, temp temporarily occupied territory of Ukraine. Uh, but uh, well, answering only your question whether, whether Europeans or the West as itself uh, can uh, um, amount pressure on Russia or do something more, I would say that uh, it's up to Ukrainians, to Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian civil society to, 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 the lead, to lead this uh, uh, deoccupation campaign. Uh, this week, uh, a bunch of Ukrainian think tanks, including Maidan of Foreign Affairs and uh, the Adnaur Front, uh, hold a conference called Militarization of the Occupied uh, Crimea and its Influence on the Regional and Global uh, Stability. So Russians are building their uh, military fortress, uh, and there will be no need uh, for such an amount of uh, people over there. So there will be uh, human rights violation, there will be... Um, attempts uh, of the so-called third authorities to uh, eject uh, from Crimea Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians and Russians, so uh, as we call them political Ukrainians. Uh, certainly there, there should be a reaction uh, from Ukraine, uh, there should be a reaction from the West, and I, I believe it will, be, uh, it will be done this way. Secondly, we need to, to uh, forge a strategy. Uh, our organization prepared and Crimea regained strategy. Unfortunately, there is no such a uh, document in the government. Uh, they still are breaking something in spite that uh, two, uh, two years uh, has passed uh, since the occupation of Crimea. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, uh, the civil society, Ukrainian civil society, is uh, doing it almost to, to fill the gaps that government is not doing. The uh, civil blockade of Crimea was uh, initiated uh, by a bunch of corruption and led by uh, Crimean Tatars. Uh, there are other activities. Uh, we are trying to push our government to do decisive steps. For example, we need to, to cancel the law on the free trade uh, or free um, economic zone in occupied Crimea that allows our businesses uh, to, to operate uh, between occupied Crimea and Ukraine, and uh, at the same time paying taxes to the occupy, uh, occupation uh, authorities. Uh, we are monitoring the violation of Ukrainian sovereign territory by the um, by, by vessels, I mean uh, ships and uh, aircrafts. Uh, we are monitoring the violation by offic 
official uh, officials from European countries, and certainly we are trying to push their governments uh, to to stop this. Uh, so we we need to um, to unite our efforts with the government to to create such an environment that uh, the price of uh, beer in Crimea for Russia will be uh, amounting and will be uh, of such a scale that it's impossible to keep. Thank you so much for the comment. Thank you for and having me. Today in our studio was Alexander Hara, diplomat and expert of the Foundation Maidana Foreign Affairs. And we are continuing our newscast.